the title of today's message is When Things Don't Go As Planned. Spurred from this. Those of you watching that may watch this video, it's our, our sanctuary is carpeted right up to these front seats with new carpet, and we were supposed to get the rest of the new carpet, and it's not here yet. And, of course, as we've just talked about, there's a conference coming this next weekend. And, uh, boy, would we like to have it carpeted. Amen. And so the sad part is, or the reality is, is that the carpet layer, not the people we bought the carpet from, but the people they hired to lay the carpet, of course, what happened was is they didn't order enough carpet for us, so they had to order more, so the carpet layer pulled off of our job, and there's that other job, and he's like, well, I'm busy now. It's like, well, wait a minute, you were busy here first before you were busy there, okay? And so we're just believing that uh, by next, I'd like to have it done by Thursday, give me a little time to put things back together, um, but by the time the conference starts, that we'll have all new carpet. When things don't go as planned. Boy, and I tell you what, there's so many times my wife will be near the end of our day and she'll say, man, today didn't go as I had planned. Anybody else ever have that saying at the end of the day? Peter, no, Peter just flies right through his, you've got to make plans, Peter. You've got to make plans to have them, you know, just saying. You know, and, and yeah, but it, but sometimes what happens is that we make plans and they don't succeed or they don't get fulfilled or not all of them come to pass. And um, so then what happens, how do we respond in those times? What, what does that do to us at the end of the day when our plans haven't gotten fulfilled the way we thought they would? Um, because that's really a big question that depends on how you answer it, uh, kind of directs our lives. It may direct how well you sleep that night. If you're worried and angst because something didn't happen the way you thought it should have happened that day. And you know what? One of the things that should happen for us as believers is we should be able to find peace and rest in our days. Okay? The other thing I thought about is when your plans don't succeed, does that indicate that you've done something wrong? Do you think, well, I must have goofed up, my plans didn't come to pass, so it's my fault? That can happen sometimes. And, and you know what? There's sometimes it might have been. But how much weight does that really carry? Do we really have to concern ourselves with that much if we were the ones that made it fall apart? Um, the other thing you could ask, is God aware of my situation? Right? Is God, does God know what's going on here? Did he see this whole thing crumble apart and my day didn't go the way I thought it should? Or do we know that he's aware of our situation that, and that he's intimately involved in our situation? And the last question I had was, did I miss God on my planning? See, that's a big question that we can ask ourselves. Well, maybe I just miss God. Maybe I just missed God. So the scripture I want to go to is Romans 8, 28. Kind of start, this whole thing kind of started it, and then the Holy Spirit started talking to me about this because, you know, I really would like to have this done yesterday. And uh, so we could enjoy it today. I mean, really, that's what it's about, is coming in here and enjoying our experience here. And to me... Thankfully, whether this half is that carpet and this half is this carpet, I believe that it's not going to affect the Holy Spirit in our ministry today. Amen? Because there's people meeting in a mud floor building somewhere, meeting in the middle of a field. And it's all about our heart, not the carpet, not our surroundings. And so Romans 8, 28 in the Passion says, So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together for good, for we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. And I like how Paul starts here. It says, so we are convinced. We are convinced. And I stop and I think about Paul's life and what he went through and what was it that 
that convinced him that every detail can work together for good, right? Because there had to be something in his life that transpired that caused him to believe that God was able to take all of the daily details and make good out of it. And we know that his life um, went through some crazy stuff. He suffered on behalf of Christ. Um, And in those sufferings and in those things, he was able to watch God take what appeared to be a bad thing and turn it for good. You know, I don't think when Paul went into the city to share the gospel that he had planned on being stoned to death. Right? But he was. He wasn't just stoned. Scripture said he was stoned to death. And they drug him out of the city and left him for dead. But God said, it's not over. And God raised him up. And I can assure you that he probably looked bad. And where did he go once God raised him up? Back into the city. Like, I'm like, no, those folks don't like me. I'm out of here. Right? But see, God had plans and purposes for that. And, and I think it's interesting, if we really stop and think about what it must have been like for the people in the city that thought Paul was now dead, we're done with this guy. Okay, we don't have to listen to him anymore. That stuff that he's trying to sell us, it's over. And however long or later, he comes walking back in, fully alive, with the same message, God loves you. Now, what kind of impact would that be on the people? He didn't come back with, you guys are under the wrath of God now. God's going to strike you, God's going to get you, and there's going to be a day of judgment that you're going to have to pay for what you did to me. God went back in with the gospel message of, God loves you. God loves you people. And, and so as I thought about Paul's life, you know, think about it. He's shipwrecked. A couple days in the water. He finally gets to shore. He's standing at the fire. Gets bit by a snake. Shakes the snake off. The people are like, oh, this guy's dying. And he doesn't die. And people are like, what's up with this guy? And through that, Paul was able to share the message of a good God, a powerful God, a God that's able to overcome poisonous snake bites. And, and so as I thought about that, that's, those are the times that convinced Paul and should convince us that God can take all the details of our days and make good out of them. See, and and I got thinking about it. So Paul said, so we are convinced. But too often, ours is more of a question, are we convinced? You switch two words around. Paul's was a statement. So we're convinced that God's able to do this, but too often in our lives, the statement is more, are we convinced that God is able to take all these things and make good out of them? And, And... As we walk through our daily lives and we watch God do these things for us, I believe that one day we will be convinced that every detail. See, we have to understand God is a God of details. If it matters to you, it matters to him. If you have a hangnail that's bothering you, it it matters to him. Amen. If you have a child that's wayward or whatever it may be, if it matters to you, it matters to him. Because, see, those are the details of your day. We have to remember that details are the small little pieces that make up the composite whole. So as you look through your day, it's all of these details that happened that at the end of the day made up your and my day. And and so what we need to do is analyze how do we respond when things don't go as planned. And, and, you know, for me, because of the, just the faithfulness of God towards me and watching him work through circumstances and situations of the details of my days and my months and my years, I've gotten now where I walk in here and I see this, 
I refuse to get angst. I just refuse. You know what? Do I want our conference to have all this carpeting? You better believe with everything in that. And I believe that it's going to happen. But I'm not going to concern myself with it. Now, I'm going to press in on the carpet layer. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to get lazy and complacent. I'm going to do what I can to try and push the ball down the court to get this carpet put in. But it's outside of my realm. I don't have the carpet for one, and I'm not a carpet layer for two. Well, I shouldn't say that. Randy and I laid the carpet in the uh, kids' room, so don't tell anyone I can lay carpet. But see, years ago, it would have been much more bothersome to me because I was at that place, place where was I convinced that God was able to take all the details? And so we need to get to the place where you say, I'm convinced that God will work this out for good. Because you know what, folks? We're going to have details in every day. Every day is going to have something that comes up in our lives. And if we can't get to the place where we know that God is bigger first and foremost, than our situation, but most of all, that God is willing and able to fix these things and to make them work out for good. Because there's stuff, you know, Vern and I and, and our family have been through quite a, a six-month period, basically, with Austin's aneurysms and my broken arm and my dad's collapsed lung. And I mean, there's just been what would look like to be a whole bunch of negative, dark stuff taking place. But because we know there's a big God that loves us, and the reason he moves on our behalf is because he loves us, simply and foremost, because he loves us. And he wants to work these things for good. And I try to tell people that have a, a life full of broken pieces, and even in our lives when things get broken, the question is, what do we do with the broken pieces? Do we sit down and analyze them and say, what can I do to fix my situation? We take the pieces to the one that loves us so completely. We take the pieces to the one that we know can take these things and make the ashes into something beautiful. But it's up to us. We have to purpose to take it to him. And too many people try on their own and their own abilities and their own strengths to fix it on their own. And they, there's frustration, there's anxiety, there's sometimes guilt and shame because they're looking at the broken pieces, thinking, I broke this. And the amazing part about God is, is that even if we're the ones that broke it, he's still excited to fix it for us. And teach us in it that, hey, let's not do that again. Amen? I can assure you that if a rack of doors starts to fall, this arm ain't going up ever again. Ain't happening. But how did I learn that? Unfortunately, I had to learn it through experience, through life experience. You know? And, and it is what it is. So quite often it's our focus on God or our situation. Because when we realize that our focus is what draws us towards what we're focused on. So if we have something in our lives that's not going the way we planned, what are we focusing on? The one that can make everything beautiful out of it, that can take all the details and work it for good? Or are we focusing on our ability and our strengths? Sometimes we think we can hide it. Or we're going to hide this thing that we did. Now, we may be able to hide it from family members, loved ones, people we work with, but there's no hiding it from God. And the sad part is, is as we hide things is when the devil's empowered because he now has us in a state where we're in fear that somebody would find out what our situation is or what we've done. But it's so freeing to be able to come out and say, you know what? My dork light was on, and I did something stupid. See, that was my saying for my son when he was being a young man growing up. 
and doing kind of goofy stuff. I'd say, Austin, your dork light's on. Oh, not again, he says. And that was my way of saying, hey, think about what you're doing. Think about what you're doing. Think about the outcome of, of what you're doing, you know. And, and even to this day, I kind of throw that at me every now and again. But um, <laughs> So we need to be able to be comfortable with enough that we know that we can put things out there. See, I remember when I was in religion, the mass that I carried around with me because I couldn't admit that I had made a mistake or that I didn't have faith for a situation that I was in, because what would happen is people would use Scripture to beat me up yeah. on what I was doing wrong, rather than using the Scripture as a salve to help heal me and show me the truth and how to get out of it. So I hid behind the mask, and you would show up at an event, a conference, church Sunday morning, or whatever, and it's like, how you doing, brother? And I'd had a bad week. Things had been rough. I had done something wrong. Somebody else had done something wrong, which affected me. But it's like I couldn't be honest about it. I had to say, oh, great, you know, God is good, and da-da-da. And, 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 but what happens then when I left there, I, came, I left with the same burden that I came in with. I wasn't free from it. Where I should have been able to go into the emergency room or the church, the body of Christ, and get healed be encouraged and edified and built up and lifted up. But because religion had me bound up, I just didn't feel like I'd do that. And that's what's so freeing about grace is, you know what, we all have stuff going on. We all have plans that don't come to pass. And that's okay. God is able to take these things and put them together. So then I was thought about, well, when things don't seem to be going as planned, what do we need to do? And I got thinking about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I'm going to read it in the Passion. Trust in the Lord completely and do not rely on your own opinions. With all your heart, rely on him to guide you, and he will lead you in every decision you make. Become intimate with him in whatever you do, and he will lead you wherever you go. You know, it's, it's that, that relationship that we have with him, the intimacy that we have with him, that we can take our situations to him and realize we can trust him. You know, how amazing to have people in your life that you can trust with your strengths and with your weaknesses, with the things you do right and the things you do wrong. That is an amazing relationship when you have people in your life like that. Because you know that you can be open and honest and upright and not worried about being condemned or belittled or besmirched and put down. That they're going to try and help you to a better place than kind of laugh at you in the place you're in. And, and that's what that relationship with the Lord is, is that eventually as we watch him put together the details of our days, and watch him bring good things from it that we can trust him and go to him and trust him completely, the scripture says. Trust in the Lord completely. Here's where we generally err is do not rely on your own opinions. We have this, this innate thought process that I'm able to handle it. And the amazing part is, is that you will be able to handle it as he leads and guides you, as the Holy Spirit feeds you wisdom and information and understanding, then you're able to go in with his help and make things work for good. But the first thing that has to happen is we have to believe that he's able to do that and that he wants to do that and that he will do that. That's why scripture says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. You're coming out of your situation by his doing, by his empowerment. Um, and so I wrote, each day life happens. This is where the details of our lives are found. It really is. You know, we have to realize that tomorrow may be one grand and glorious day. It may be not the greatest day. It may be 50-50, 60-40. We don't know. 
but we know who's already there on our behalf to help us when we have need. And that should comfort us. That should comfort us. Um, and so God, being the Alpha and the Omega, he can take the details and work them into our good. See, that's the amazing part is because he sees into our future. We don't. He knows how me receiving Christ in prison, he's able to weave that into the rest of my life and make something beautiful out of that window of time that I was in prison. Amen? I'm fully persuaded that he's going to take Austin with all of these scars and all of this visible stuff and use him as a testimony. The fallacy is religion will tell you that God did that for the testimony. See, that's what people would say to me as well. God put you in prison so that you would have this testimony. And I would tell them, no, my lifestyle put me in front of the judge. The judge put me in prison. Thanks be to God, he was willing to meet me there, redeem my life, and make something beautiful out of it. I said, because if that's the case, if God is putting people in prison to create a testimony for him, God is failing miserably. Because not many people leave prison with a testimony for God. But those that call on his name will. They'll get taken out of that kingdom of darkness right there in that prison cell, whatever, translated into light. Amen? And so God knows, because he's the Alpha and the Omega, we can trust him with the pieces. He knows how to form and fashion it um, to make things good on our behalf. He just does. Um, Proverbs 16, 9. It says, within your heart you can make plans for your future, but the Lord chooses the steps you take to get there. And, and so what happens is you think, well, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't make plans, right? If my plans aren't going to come to pass some of the times, well, maybe I shouldn't make any plans. Well, the problem with that is this scripture tells us that within our hearts, you can make plans for your future. It doesn't say here, don't make any plans. It says within your heart, make plans for your future. So planning is a good thing. The question is, when things don't work out as we planned, how do we respond to it? See, that's really the big question. How do we respond to it? And the nice part is, is that when things seem to be not working out, See, that's what happens. It looks like it's not going to work out. But when we trust in the Lord with all of our heart and not lean on our own understanding, see, that's our own understanding is when we think, well, this just isn't going to work out. But how many of us could stand up and testify that I was at that place of thinking one time and then I watched God work it out? You know, there are times in our lives when things happen and you think, well, that was a big waste of time. And then sometimes later you look back and say, oh, I can see now how that's woven into today for me. How what, I, what happened then now is affecting me here now. You know, like I said, it, when things happen to us in the contrary or the negative, and then when something comes up later on, we can have some insight for somebody else. I can guarantee you if I saw somebody rolling a rack of doors, I'd say, hey, listen, whatever you do, if those things fall, don't try and catch them. Well, how did I learn that? Well, it was the details of my life. That was part of the details of my life. I stuck my arm up, thought I could do something, fractured my elbow. And God's done a miracle in that, too. It's just been unbelievable. Anyways, um, So when we become intimate with him in whatever we do, this scripture says that he will lead us in wherever we go. And we can rest in that fact that he knows where we need to go. He has it intimately detailed out for us. If we'll just trust him, make our plans, and then trust him with them. Amen? I can assure you, 10 years ago, 
this wasn't my plan. In fact, I really kind of tried with everything that's in me to stay away from a pulpit. Well, and the reason being was, is at that time, my view and opinion of God was different than it is today. See, I was afraid of getting up and sharing what God had put on my heart because I thought that I had to be the empowerment of it. I've said it before, I had this big list of disqualifiers, what disqualified me from the ministry. And finally the day came when God says, you don't qualify you. Throw that list away. I qualified you. Knowing the list you had, I still qualified you. Amen? And when I finally got rid of the list and realized and came to the truth that God is the one that qualified me, then my apprehension went away. And then as God was faithful and God was committed and, and the details of my life started getting woven together, then the apprehension went away. It's, it's still an awesome thing to get up and share because who am I to come up and share with you guys? Well, first of all, I'm a child of the Most High God. Second of all, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And third of all, I'm called to do this. And when that reality sets in and, and I just will yield myself to it, it's exciting and fun. It really is. And I, and I enjoy doing it. Um, so too often we're stressed over why our plans are not working out. We need to stop that. Like I said earlier, we need to quit stressing about it. Can we stop and look at it? Absolutely. We, there's no reason we can't sit down and, and let the Holy Spirit minister to us maybe where we need to adjust some plans or, or reconfigure some things. That's what he wants to do with us. Um, but we should be resting in God's ability to direct us in the outcome, even in the little things. Even in the little things. You know, like Verna said, we have, we have a big weekend coming up. It's the biggest weekend we have every year at Grace and Truth. It's exciting. It's, there's ministry galore. The Lord does a lot of neat stuff here. But there's a lot of details that go into it. Placement of tables, food ready, you know, just all the things, getting name tagged and making sure there's a table for the greeters. And, and, just, and, and it's, it's not that it's that difficult. It's just things that need to be done. And we make a checklist, and we go down the list. But the main thing is we give it over to God. So that if the weekend happens, that it looks like this, and I'll make this look better. Um, it is what it is. You know what I mean? It's not going to hinder the Holy Spirit from coming and changing hearts and changing lives and ministry going forth. This really is more, how would I say it, for for our pride of looking good, moreover than the ministry not happening, right? It just, it, it, we want to have it looking as nice as it can. And if this is what we have, we'll still make it having look as nice as it can. But that's just as nice as it can look at this point. Could it look better? Yeah, the new carpet would certainly look better. But we're not going to stress over it. I refuse to stress over it. The Message Bible in Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, When we focus on and give our situation to him, we'll have peace and not stress. Trust in the Lord, or um, be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And the peace of God, the peace of God will come and guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so we've got to let the anxiety go over our plans not working out. We've just got to let it go and just trust God that he's able to do that. Um, too often we tend to focus on the few things that may not be working out and not on the many things that are. That's such a tendency of the human condition is to, to look at the one small thing that's not working the way we want it to and forget about the massive amount of things that are working the way we desire them to work. And, and we need to let the Holy Spirit minister to us in those areas that quit making that such a focus. Amen? Quit making that such a focus. And let us rejoice in the things that are going well. Because what happens is as we take our focus off the little thing and put it on the big thing, the little thing becomes even littler. Because the big thing becomes bigger. 
And so it's such a focus issue. Um, but unfortunately, our faith happens to grow in the valleys. It's just the truth, guys. You know, I find that when everything, the water is glassy smooth, the song that I sing is prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to, you know, because, because what do I need God for? Bank account's full, bills are paid. Nowadays, your gas tank's full, that's huge. Uh, you know, food in the refrigerator, we're covered. But unfortunately, it's in those times where we need him to step in and help us through a situation that we thought we had all planned out just right, and then all of a sudden a broken arm came in the mix of the picture, or a situation, a sickness, or a loved one, or whatever it is, that threw the whole thing into chaos, and things aren't going just the way we had planned, that we can say, all right, Lord, you see it, you know it, you know what I have need of, I'm just going to rest, here it is, here's the pieces, Minister it back to me on what I need to do at this point, and I'm just going to rest in you knowing that you care for me and you desire to weave all this together for good. You know, and, and I've always said, it, it, our, our Christian life a lot of times looks like the backside of a tapestry. And if you think about that scripture, he says he wolves everything, he weaves everything together for good. When you look at the back of a tapestry, it's just a mess. There's colors and there's strings going from here to there and knots and all kinds of stuff. And so if that was what our focus was, it's not very delightful to look at. But then when you flip the tapestry around and you see the beautiful picture on the other side of it, see, that's what God is seeing. And that's what we need to see with our eyes of faith is that God is making this beautiful picture out of our lives even though things seem to be a little disjointed in our day-to-day -day activity. God is working these things together for good, for good. God is a good God. And you know, it's interesting, as I went in and I looked at scripture that talked about the plans of God, there are so many I could have brought up. Because God is a God that has things planned out. He planned Jesus to go to the cross on just the right day. Scripture says, in the fullness of time, Jesus was born. Not a day early, not a day late, in the fullness of time. And you and I could look at this, this window of time and say, boy, humanity could have used Jesus a lot earlier. There was a lot of crummy stuff that took place in humanity. Why didn't God have Jesus born earlier and redeem mankind? I don't know. All I know is God had planned for, at that time that this baby would be born in a stable. There was no room in the inn. Now you would think God would say, hey, I could at least have one room left open. My son's coming. But see, the prophecy said that there wouldn't be a room. The prophecy said it would be in a stable. The prophecy said it wouldn't be in Bethlehem, it'd be in Nazareth, or in Nazareth in Bethlehem. And so we need to rest in the fact that God is able to take all this stuff and make it good. So here we are with our life experiences, the details of our lives. I mean, that's literally what we have are the details of our lives. And, and what those details make is our testimony. It really does. The details of our lives make up a testimony. And there's times that I've seen people get up and testify, and unfortunately, their that what they testified to, testification, that's quite a word, <laughs> what they testified to was how bad they were. And then at the end, oh, and by the way, God's a good God. A testimony is about how good God is. When we get up and testify, and so what we're doing is we're saying, hey, listen, I had all these broken things that happened in the details of my life, and I gave them to God, and he made something beautiful out of them. And when people hear that, they say, you know, I've got this big pile of broken stuff. I wasn't sure what to do with it because I've tried to fix it, and it still looks bad when I do it. And it's heavy, and it's burdensome to carry around. Our, our testimonies share that, hey, there's somewhere you can take those pieces. His name is Jesus, and he loves you. 
and he died for you. Um, and that he'll able to take all that stuff and make a beautiful tapestry out of it if you'll let him. And so really what I'd like to do right now is ask, is there somebody that would get up here and share a testimony about how God took some broken things and made something beautiful on them? Because I know every one of us have one. Every one of us have one. And so I'd like to spend the rest. we got 10 minutes. Um, it doesn't, come on up, Terry. Everett, can you bring me the microphone? Um, and just testify to the goodness of God, how he took broken stuff and made it beautiful. Why don't you come stand here so the camera's on you, Terry? Thank you, Everett. Thank you. Some of you noticed that my wife and I weren't here last Sunday. We had a funeral to attend out in Colorado my uh, aunt, my mom's uh, last uh, sibling passed. She was old, very old, and had had a stroke five years previous. So she wasn't like her death was unexpected. We hadn't seen her in years. She lived out in the middle of Colorado, like from Denver, it was still five hours out there. And my wife and I, we we really felt like we needed to go. I had a sister from Missouri was gonna go and my brother from Wyoming went. And there was a lot more kids, a lot more of my siblings that couldn't go, but we, they were just, the family were really after us to, well, are you guys coming or what? And we just, we just waited until we felt right about it. And uh, we rented a car. So we're heading out there. We're gonna drive the whole way. And uh, my son lives in Denver. And I asked him if we could spend the night at his house um, when we got out there and then drive on over the mountains the next day. And he said, yeah, yeah, that'd be good. You're, you'll be here for my birthday. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's your birthday. Where I, I didn't say that, but yeah, that'd be good. He says, but I've got to work on my birthday, and that's the day the funeral was, too. But he said, I'll be back late, late then. So... We went on over the mountains to the funeral, and we were so glad we went. And, and my cousins, my cousins, my sister, my brother, they were all just thrilled that we had come. I mean, it was just, my aunt was a believer. Her entire family was a believer. And you know, these are people that, my mom was the first one to get born again in that family. And everybody pretty much just labeled her a religious nut. She wanted them all saved, you know. And she would, she prayed, my mom prayed for, and it's so interesting to see all those cousins and aunts and uncles have all been saved. So it was, it was a glorious funeral. It really was. And we had a feed, we've heard a few jokes about funeral food. This was the best feed you ever had. I mean, it was, so we drive back over the mountains the next day to my son's house and he's gone, he's gone. And we've got his house, he's got a beautiful home it's like Airbnb. We're just, we got the place to ourselves, and it was so nice. And then my son's fiance is a doctor of audiology, and she's been telling me for months, you come out here, I'll give you a new set of hearing aids, and we'll get you. We've got, we got uh, new hearing aids with uh, Bluetooth, and uh, that was on Saturday. And then she says, and we've got a birthday dinner planned for Justin for Sunday evening, and if any of you know me very good, it's hard for me to take very many days in a row off from work. <laughs> I, I am self-propelled. Uh, self, self <laughs> I, I, uh, I'll tell you, we just had to relax and go with something that would you think a funeral was a bad thing. But it just worked out. Justin and his fiance and my granddaughters were so appreciative of us being there for his birthday dinner. Sunday afternoon, we were up in the mountains of 7,000 feet. We had a folding chair in the middle of a stream with our feet up on a rock. Just, I'll tell you what, my wife and I, we both commented on the way home, our aches and pains are gone. I mean, we felt, I mean, we had 2,000 miles of driving, and normally that takes a lot out of me. We come back, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, my son and I, after, after the dinner on Sunday night, we went over to his house, and we commenced to drink a little whiskey too. So I was, I was a little concerned about how the trip was gonna be 
the next day driving home. It was, it was great. I actually woke up Monday morning feeling good. So God is, God is good, and he made something awesome out of something that you weren't looking forward to. This trip, I was, I was literally kind of dreading it. And now all week long, and this is really cool, you guys, because so we drove home Monday, so I'm off a work day there. So we start working Tuesday. We just went through the week, and you know what? Yesterday was a nice, rainy, cool day, right? My wife and I both commented, yesterday seemed like Sunday. We lost a day and gained a day, all in the same week. <laughs> Thanks be to God. It just was that good. So thank you. Hallelujah. Come on up. You know, it's interesting. Come on up. If you think about just a matter of a week, whether it was a week prior or a week after, Terry and Takabi would have been out there for the funeral, but then the next week they'd be like, oh, now it's his birthday. How fun would it have been to be out there for his birthday? And God was able to weave that all that together and make it turn out. Yes, God is good. I think what I, I, the point I'd really like to get across to people today is that sometimes God's leading you and you don't realize it. Oh, amen. Sometimes you think, oh, I messed up so bad. Oh, why did I make that decision? Da 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 da. But if you look back after it's all over, you begin to see how God put this person in your life. He moved this mountain to make this happen. And you're like, wow, God, you were there. Because I did that. I lived in Colorado for 25 years and uh, got a divorce from my ex husband. And then he went out and got drunk, wrecked his motorcycle, disabled his arm, and nobody in the family would take care of him, so I let him come into my apartment, and I took care of my ex-husband, got his arm, got him back to normal, kind of normal. And then he decided that it was a great idea for him to move to Iowa and raise dogs. And he begged me to come with him. I promise I'll quit drinking. I promise I will. And I'm like, you will not. And he said, no, I really, I promise you, I will not drink anymore. Because it was a, with him it was a problem. I'm not saying that having a, a, a beer is wrong. But he'd drink a case a day, so. And it changed who he was. But anyway, uh, so, I still cared about him, you know? And uh, I thought, okay, well, maybe the Lord wants to put us back together. So I quit my cleaning business, went, to co went with him, packed up all my stuff, went to Iowa. He moved me in with this other couple into their house up in the upstairs. I've turned the sink on and cockroaches and bugs and all this stuff come up out of the drain. And I'm like, oh, Lord, what have I done? But anyway, I stuck that out for about a month. And then I was cooking for everybody. And then his wife got jealous because her husband liked my cooking. I'm trying to make this short, OK? <laughs> Finally, I went to Don, and, I, and he did not quit drinking. So I went to Don, and I said, you know what? We're beating a dead horse. This isn't going to work. I'm going back to Colorado. I said, but I'm going to stop in Sioux Falls because I want to see my brother. He said, well, if you're going back to Colorado, so am I. <laughs> and all the money that I had saved, we just got out of town. His pickup broke down, and I spent all my money trying to get his pickup going. I mean, it was just one thing after another. And I was beating myself up so bad. I'm like, oh, God, this is the worst decision I've ever made in my life. Why did I do this? Why? And I was just so angry and so upset. And I got to my brother's house, and he let us stay with him, him and Barb. And then uh, he said, well, why don't you stay a while? Because all my kids were raised and out of the house. And he said, why don't you stay a while? And I said, 
Okay, well, I will, but I got to have a job. So my ex-husband's daughter's father-in-law got me a job at Cody's, that restaurant that used to be down on I-90 uh, that they tore down. Got me a job at Cody's, and I was the morning waitress, and I'd go in and open up. And Mr. Randy Hofer would come in every morning and meet his his eight or nine friends, and they'd sit around the table, and I'd tell them that they're the worst gossipers ever that ever hit the world. And anyway, to make a long story short, he invited me out on a date. We went on a date. We've been together ever since. But what, what I thought was the worst decision of my life became the best blessing of my life. Amen. And I didn't know God was leading me. I had no idea. I thought I was leading me and I was beating myself up. And meeting Randy was the greatest blessing in my life. And then which led to us having a home church, which led to buying this building for another church, which led to where we are now, folks grace and truth so God is good and he's always busy working every single detail of your life out for him, for good he's a good God he loves you extravagantly unconditionally all the time and never never get into a place of fear when you think you made a big boo-boo because he's working it out he's, you can't see it sometimes and you can't feel it sometimes but trust me he is you know why not because you deserve it not because you do everything right just because he loves you with an everlasting love Amen. from the day you were formed in the womb to the end of your life his goodness and mercy are following you. And the word follow in the Hebrew means pursuing you and hunting yes. you down. Goodness and mercy pursuing you and hunting you down all the days of your life. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we're going to end with Romans 8, 28, right where we started. So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together for good, for we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. It's all because of love that he weaves it together for us. Father, we thank you this morning as we've stopped and looked at the views of when things don't go the way we've planned. Father, we're so thankful that you can override and take all of the pieces and weave them together to make beautiful things out of them. Even when we don't understand, we know that you do. And we can rest in that fact that every good and every perfect gift comes down from you and you don't change. You're not one way one day and one way another. You're always for us. And so we give you praise in this place today. Thank you for the food we're about to receive. Bless it to our bodies. Bless our fellowship. In the mighty and precious and holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Love you guys. You're the best God's got.